Yeah, I'm Alex Schultz, and uh, I'm going to be talking to you guys today about the hyperparameter mechanics and optimization. So, you guys hear me okay? Is the volume? I hold it too close. Okay. <laughs> um, so, a uh, guy just talked to you about how you can uh, optimize the hyperparameters based on um, auto tuning jobs. I'm actually going to talk about the, the specific hyperparameters and some of the ranges that you can use. And then at the end, I'm going to go over some tips and tricks um, for improving your model performance and hopefully your training time so you can actually take advantage and, and leverage those hyperparameters um, in your, your training process. So uh, what we're going to talk about, basically we're going to go over the different hyperparameters. Um, I'm going to talk about, or excuse me, I'm going to explain what hyperparameters are and then go into the available ones for DeepRacer and then uh, talk about the specific tuning uh, for hyperparameters and then open it up to any questions at the end. So first off, uh, what are hyperparameters? We're talking about machine learning. These are pretty much the, uh, the settings that are external to the model itself. So the model um, has all these weights and, and biases that are being trained during the training process. Well, these hyperparameters are external knobs and dials and, and things that you can tune to actually optimize the training process that um, should hopefully help improve the, the training time and improve the performance so that you can get the best lap times. Um, and one thing to keep in mind is that there's not really one size fits all here. So a lot of things go into the training process. So you know your, your reward function, hyperparameters. Um, and so you can you really have to experiment with this stuff. So it's not a it's not a exact, you know, there's not a one answer for this. All right, so the available hyperparameters for DeepRacer. Um, are listed here. So there's gradient descent batch size, number of epochs, uh, learning rate, entropy, discount factor, loss type, and number of experience episodes between each policy iteration. So we're going to touch on each one of these. So the first one, um, number of recent experiences. And so what this is, this is essentially the, um, the number of experiences that you're going to use in your training process. So if you're not if you're not familiar with the actual how it's trained, the training process, um, the way it works is the agent is driving around the track and it's collecting a bunch of experience and it's doing that in the form of images and then the actions that it took um, at, each, at each step in the, the training process. And so the, the batch size is essentially how much of that experience data you're going to be incorporating into the, the training uh, step after the number of uh, completions or, or attempted completions around the track. So. The default for that is 64, um, but the possible values are listed here, 32 to basically to 512. Um, so the larger the batch size that you, that you choose for this, um, typically the more stable your training is going to be. If that kind of makes sense, because if you have a small sample set, you're not really incorporating all of the actions that the car is taking. So um, the next one is the number of epochs, and that's basically how many times you go through that training data. And this one kind of goes hand in hand with the batch size, because what you're doing here is you're, when you're updating this, this model for the car, you're basically taking all that experience data and you're passing it through the model and you're updating the weights and, and values. And uh, the number of times that you do that is going to you know, dictate the number of updates that you make to that particular uh, model during that, that actual training session. And so uh, the options are from three to 10, the default being three. Okay, learning rate is the um, it's the size of the updates that you make during each training cycle um, through through the training process. So, when you think of these models, they're they're just these huge graphs, right? And so, when you um, when you're making these updates, the bigger the updates that you make, the more changes you're you're going to be making to the model, um, and that could help you train a lot faster. But then you also kind of have the um, the possibility of over overshooting um, the result that you're trying to get. So you have to be careful with this one because if you have too high of a learning rate, the adjustments to the model are going to be too big and it's not going to um, it's not going to converge at the end. Entropy. Um, so as as the agent is driving around the, the track, the entropy is basically how much um, randomness you introduce into the actions that the car is going to take. And so you need this 
because in order for the car to learn and to, to explore um, the space that it has available to it, it has to take random actions. And uh, in order for it to find the most optimal path around, uh, it has to try different things. And if the entropy is too low, it's not going to do that. It's just going to use the what it's learned so far through the model updates. And so um, the entropy is one of those things where you want you want a little bit, you know, you want more sort of at the beginning of training, and then. You know, sometimes as things progress, you can kind of dial it back and let the let the agent start to uh, exploit what it's learned so far. Um, and so that's that's a uh, value between zero and one, with uh, default starting at uh, 0 0.01. Okay, the next one is discount factor, and that's basically how many steps the agent is going to look ahead when it's trying to make a decision uh, through through an episode. And it's going to take account, take into account um, where it, it basically thinks it's gonna be, you know, so many steps ahead, and that's gonna drive the decision that it's making right now. And so the, the larger the discount factor, the more into the future the agent's gonna be looking um, to make the current decisions for the step that it's at. And um, the default for that is uh, 0.999. And so what that translates into is the car is going to be looking a thousand steps ahead from where it's currently at. So at um, 0.9, it's basically just going to be looking at 10 steps ahead. So uh, that's a value that you can play with and you know, experiment with. Okay, the loss type. Um, so during during any machine learning neural network training process, you you have to evaluate um, the the prediction results against the ground truth. And so what the loss type does is it, it's the, the, um, the function that metric, or excuse me, it's the function that gives you the metric that you're trying to, uh, to train or to optimize for. So basically, um, there's, there's two loss types that you can choose from. There's Huber and there's mean squared error. And the, uh, the Huber one is going to make smaller increments to the model weights as the updates become larger compared to the mean squared error. And so, um, really, what this amounts to is uh, there's there's kind of two different um, ways to, to use this. So when you're when you're having issues reaching uh, convergence, then you want to switch to the Huber loss uh, loss function. Okay, and last we have the number of episodes between policy updates. So the episodes are just the attempts for the agent to get all the way around the track, and um, the number of episodes is going to determine how many attempts it makes before it switches to the training process. So you've all seen in the simulator uh, where the car just stops for a period of time, and that's because it's in the training process. So the, the number of episodes that you have this set to is going to, to drive that. Um, the more episodes that you do, or that you set it to, obviously the more experience data that you can generate. So this is another one that kind of goes hand in hand uh, with the, the batch. Um, uh, gradient descent batch size. So uh, the default here is 20, uh, but you can go as, go as low as five and up to 100. And so generally, um, you know, as the model starts to converge, uh, it, it's a good idea to kind of dial this back because if the car is getting around and around repeatedly, then you're just going to be waiting a long time for um, for the policy updates to happen. So any questions so far? All right, so we've gone over the, the available hyperparameters, and so now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about some strategies for how you can tune your own hyperparameters for uh, for training. Um, so the first thing that I would do is if you're, especially if you're new to DeepRacer, uh, I would stick with the defaults. So the defaults have been predetermined by the AWS uh, team who actually built this, and it's a good starting point, and it's pretty much guaranteed to get you around the track. So if you don't know where to start, start here, because at least you know you have a pretty good probability that it's actually going to, to start to work. And then once you, once you start to uh, make you know, laps around the, the track, then you can start to play with the different settings and see what it does. OK, so then that leads to the next one, which is once, you, um, once you've made your, your changes and your settings, 
uh, then just make small changes. Don't You don't want to just kind of go gangbusters on these settings and start changing all these different things at once because the model is going to be changing over time. And if you do that, you're not going to know what effect each individual hyperparameter had. Um, so it's really, really difficult when you're changing you know, any more than one variable at a time to see sort of how that impacts the overall performance. So make small changes, um, and that's going to help you to risk kind of overshooting where you're trying to get uh, as far as convergence and, and good lap times. Um, another thing, too, is make, make your training time short. So in the console, you have the ability to uh, clone your models. So by keeping, an, um, keeping your training episode short, your training cycle short, uh, that allows you to kind of have more snapshots, if you will, of models that you can use to play with. Um, and then with keeping them, you know, keeping your training process short, you also want to keep detailed notes. So you want to keep track of what changes you made and what effect that had on the overall training process. So if you know if you change the the learning rate um, and you know all of a sudden your training went way off, you want to make sure that you record that. And then we, as you create your snapshots, you want to label them in such a way where you're keeping track of you know these are these are the things that I did. This is the impact I have. Maybe I need to go back and, and start from a previous snapshot and uh, you know start over or make different changes or something. Um, and the way that you can measure your updates or the way that you can measure that stuff quantitatively is by using the logs. So if you're not using the logs, you're doing it wrong, right? So the logs are really key to success here. Um, in fact, there's, there's tools. Uh, Tomas is left now, but he's got um, this Jupyter notebook that he's extended and uh, added a whole bunch of extra support to. So getting in there, getting understanding the logs and, and understanding how your um, hyperparameters are affecting the performance is key uh, when trying to update these hyperparameters. And then finally, uh, what I would say is you can start, when you first start, um, I know I said initially to uh, start with the defaults, but once you've kind of got the hang of it and you want to sort of start from scratch, then what you can do is you can start aggressive and sort of try to try to get the model to learn as quickly as possible, um, because it's going to when it first starts, it doesn't know what it's doing. So you can have larger learning rate, you can have um, you know kind of kind of more aggressive uh, settings for your hyperparameters, and then as it starts to converge, then you can start to dial that back down and sort of fine tune it to make sure that um, you're not you're not sort of overshooting where you're trying to get. So. Um, and I think that's all I've got. Does anybody else have any tips or any questions or anything for this hyperparameter tuning? What do I mean by aggressive? Um, so, so I mentioned learning rate. So if you jack the learning rate up real high, um, that would be something that, that typically when I start a new training run, I'll have it set real high just, just because I want to make sure that I'm getting sort of as much uh, updates as I can. So. Normally, when you train a neural network, you're setting random weights initially, and it's going to it's going to get pretty close to convergence pretty quick, and then it starts to slow down in, in the um, performance of the training. So that's one. Uh, you can also, you know, have larger batch sizes or, or more episodes or things like that. So, good question. Let's right. check the uh, the social account and see what came through. Sounds good. Just a second. That's all we got. All right, thanks, guys. Thank you very much.